And, you know, who better to talk about it than uh, your friend Warren Hetty. So, uh, you know, Warren, Thank take you it very away. much, Raymond. Um, Keita, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to share the story of sake with you, and especially this sake. Um, it's from a new sake brewery in uh, Ishikawa. It's called Noguchi Naohiko Kenkyujo. And I'll be talking about uh, Noguchi Toji later. But I wanted to thank Keita for ordering this sake for us. Uh, this comes from my hands. Uh, I made the sake. I even put the label on the bottle. And it's available for sale in different places. But for tonight, it's 700 yen if you want to. <laughs> thank you. So I'm Gordon, and you can follow me on Twitter. And my presentation tonight is to try to explain why I think sake is so important, not just because it's delicious, but as we are living in Japan, as we are living in Kyoto, I think we should take some time and appreciate Japanese sake. I think my story in sake begins with my father. Uh, my father lived in Japan in the late 40s. Uh, he was defending Japan as part of the U.S. Air Force at the Komaki uh, base camp in Aichi Ken. So he spent a couple of years here as a young man. And when I was born 25 years later, that's me <laughs> with my father. Uh, the stories that he liked to share the most were about his adventures in Japan. So as a young man, I would try to get my hands on anything related to Japan. And he really gave me some great uh, reverence for the country that I eventually called my home. I started brewing sake uh, about six years ago, actually, in Fukuoka Ken. And these are two of my first bottles. Uh, uh, Jimi Hendrix is on the left. He's my rock and roll inspiration. And in this series, we had a series of famous rock and roll legends. We had a Keith Richards sake. <laughs> we had a Mick Jagger sake. And then at the end of the brewing season, I was featured in the newspaper, and my brewery surprised me by putting my picture on the label of one of our sakes. So I thought, how does it get any better than this? I made it, and now I can look at my face while I drink it. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm wearing the hapi and the maikake, the maikake is an apron, from this sakagura. It's called a wakitakea shuzo. It's perhaps one of the oldest sakaguras in Kyushu. It's in a Taunashimaru Fukuoka Ken. <clears throat> and my master at the time was Yoko Toji. Yoko-san took the time to start teaching me about sake. I like to mention that it was through Twitter that I found this job. And I say that because I said on Twitter one day, I'm going to Kyushu to learn about sake, but I don't know where to go. Can somebody give me some advice? And a person who became my friend, his name is Tony, he said, I know where we can go. Let's go to see Wakatakea Shuzo. Uh, we can do a tour there. And because of that, we met the Shacho and the Toji, and they told me, that if I wanted to learn about making sake, I should come back to Japan. And so I went home at the end of my vacation and I quit my job. <laughs> and I turned around and I came back to Japan to learn about sake brewing. The sake that we serve tonight comes from this great man on the left. Um, uh, he's really a legend. Uh, his name is uh, Noguchi Toji. Uh, he began his career in sake, um, this is his ninth decade. So if you can imagine, in the late 1940s, he started his career. He became a master in 1961, and he started our brewery just three years ago. And uh, he is called one of the four guardians of heaven of this guild. And there's many great tojis in Japan. A toji is a brewmaster. Many people think Noguchi toji is our most significant. There's many reasons for this, but the one thing I like to cite is the national new sake competition. There's only one national sake competition. It's been going on for 108 years. And Noguchi toji has won 27 gold medals at this competition, <laughs> more than any other toji who ever lived. So if gold medals count for anything, 
or the taste of his sake counts for anything, we can say he is a great person. And this is me <laughs> sweating away in the Koji Mural. I'll talk about Koji later, but I want to mention that this room can get as hot as 51 degrees Celsius. <laughs> and I was spending as much as five hours a day in this room um, with very high humidity. So one of the reasons why I'm not working there is I developed some health problems and I had to leave my job. But um, I wouldn't have traded it for anything in the world. Um, I'll talk more about Koji later, but this is really perhaps the heart of how we make Japanese sake. There's four ingredients to Japanese sake. I know this may sound obvious to some of you, but I want to mention them. We have rice on the left. In the upper right, this is Aspergillus orizai otherwise known as koji. This has been called the national fungus of Japan. Without koji, we would not have miso, mirin, nihonshu. We would not have shoyu. We would not have our mori. We would not have so many really wonderful products. And it's the heart of sake brewing. And on the lower left, we have fushimi. I've mentioned earlier in my presentation why Kyoto is so special. Nowadays, in all of Kyoto Prefecture, there's about 43 or 44 sake breweries. At one time, in its peak, there was 324. Mm. And the heart of Kyoto sake brewing was taking place in Fushimi. And on the lower right, we have yeast from the National Brewing Society of Japan. Um, this brewing society started in 1905, in part by the government, to do R&D research to find the best <coughs> yeast to make the most delicious sakes. So I'm giving you a very brief overview, but these are the four ingredients to sake. Some people want to call sake a rice wine, and I disagree. Sake is sake. We don't call a Cabernet Sauvignon a grape beer, <laughs> and we don't call a Hefeweizen a wheat wine. They're unique categories, beer and wine. So is Japanese sake. When we go shopping for sake, there's three kinds of sakes we can typically buy. The sake that we're being served tonight is Hanjozo. Hanjozo is the four basic ingredients, and we add a little bit of a neutral distilled spirit. It's added to release aroma that might otherwise be trapped. About 25% of the sake that's sold in Japan is of a premium quality, what we call chuzo kotakemai. And the other 75% is futsu shu. Futsu shu has other ingredients added to it. It could be MSG, it could be fortified highly with alcohol, there could be sugars that are added to it. This accounts for 75% of the sake that people are making in Japan. And I think it's one of the reasons why sake has been in decline. We can say since 1974 that this was the peak year for sake production in Japan. And virtually every year since 1974, sake production has gone down, with few exceptions. Today, about 6% of the alcohol that Japanese people drink is Nihonshu, only 6%. So on behalf of the people in the trade, we want to educate people about sake so it's no longer such a mystery. And by teaching people how delicious sake can be and why it's significant, we hope that it will grow. This is so hard to see, but many times people have some questions about how sake is made. I borrowed this from Hakatsuru. For a long time, Hakatsuru, a brewery in Kobe, was the largest sake brewery in Japan. But in recent years, um, Takara Shuzo has overtaken it. Takara Shuzo was a Kyoto company. Number three on this list, I think it's number three, is Gekekan, another Kyoto company. So two of the largest sake breweries in Japan happen to hail from our town. Um, I just want to show this to you. Do you have any questions about what you see in this page? <laughs> this process, from when we start milling the rice, we take brown rice and we're polishing it to make it smaller. The table rice that you buy to eat at home, 
they've taken away 10% of the outside of the kernel of rice and left 90% behind. When we make sake, we're usually taking away 30% and leaving 70 behind. But sometimes, for the more expensive sakes, they're taking away 40 or 50 or 60% of the outside of the rice. The reason why we're doing that is that there are impurities to the sake brewing process that live on the outside of the rice. These things are lipids, fats, and proteins. On the inside of good sake, sake rice is just starch. And that's why we polish the rice, because the starch is the best ingredient for the yeast and the koji to work with. This whole process might take four to six weeks. Here we have semi buai. So on the left, we have brown rice. And the smaller the rice gets, the more expensive it gets. It is said there's 105 varieties of sake rice in Japan. The most popular of these sake rices is called Yamada Nishiki. It comes primarily from uh, Hyogo, but I believe there's 27 other prefectures that are growing this rice. Yamada Nishiki is the king of sake rice. So if you're looking for the most popular sake rice, if you can see Yamada Nishiki on the menu or on the bottle, it's the best rice, or at least it's the most popular. When the rice gets to be 23% of its original size, this accounts for about one one hundredth of one percent of all of the sake that's made. That bottle of sake or that glass is going to be very expensive and very delicate. <laughs> you should drink it chilled, the smaller it gets, and you should drink it in a wine glass in my opinion, because oftentimes there's aroma that might be lost if we're drinking it from a cup. And here's another chart that explains rice polishing. I prefer Junmai Shu, but I'm not opposed to having sake with alcohol added to it. When it gets to be smaller, this is super premium, and this accounts for about 1% of the sake that's made in Japan. When it gets to be 60% polish or semi buai, it accounts for about 8% of the sake in Japan. You don't have to drink the super expensive stuff. You can come down here to Tokobetsu Junmai or to Junmai Shu and find some very delicious sake. If we were shopping, we could spend a thousand or fifteen hundred yen on a very fine bottle of sake. We don't have to spend that much money on it. This is going to sound silly to some of you, but many people don't know how to taste sake. I think because it comes in a small cup and not in a wine glass, we make a mistake by not thinking that it has aroma. Sake can have aroma. And when it comes in a small cup, we tend to drink it too quickly. So there's five steps to evaluating the sake, and I'm going to demonstrate. Sometimes sake can have color. Sometimes it's clear as water. If you see some color, that might be interesting to you doesn't mean that it's bad sake. It might be a hint about the brewing process. So the first step is the evaluation of color. We might notice some aroma. Don't be afraid to put your nose in the glass to find the aroma. If you don't smell anything, it doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. It just means you haven't developed a nose for sake. It's a learned skill. The next step is, I think, the most important. I'm going to put the sake in my mouth, but I'm not going to swallow it right away. I'm going to do something that may look kind of odd, but the sake has some secrets. The way to find those secrets is to rinse your mouth with the sake, almost like it's mouthwash. And while I hold the sake in my mouth, I might breathe through my note through my mouth. It might this inhale, it might sound like a slurp. I'm adding air to the sake, which is going to revitalize it. I'm going to hold it in my mouth, and I'm going to breathe in and out through my nose. After I've done evaluating it, I'm going to let it go down my palate, go down my throat. And the last step is I'm going to exhale. This is what a judge would do. If you're in a restaurant, every sip of sake does not have to be this way. But if it's your first time tasting the sake, you might as well taste it to the fullest.
now I've evaluated the sake. <laughs> so if you've had sake before and you thought, oh, well, it's nothing special, it, it doesn't have aroma, I prefer beer or wine, that's your own personal business. But if you're not tasting sake in this way, then maybe you've never quite tasted it yet. It would be like eating your food too fast. We have to savor it. I've mentioned aroma. I think there's important scientific reasons why sake can have aroma. There are natural byproducts to the fermentation process called esters. These esters are naturally available, and then they happen during the fermentation process. Esters are what gives wine the bouquet. Esters are also available in sake, but there's twice as many esters in sake than in wine. So sake has this potential for aroma that many people haven't quite understood. Understanding aroma is also very important because of the way our nose can influence our taste. This flavor, it works together with the aroma and it is said that sometimes most of what we taste actually is coming from aroma and not necessarily from our tongue. It's coming from our nose. There's other things about sake. With wine, like champagne, we're serving it at one temperature. It can be said that sake can be served at 10 different temperatures. Mm -hmm. And unlike wine, where we have rules about the kind of glasses you can use for service, there's no real rules about how to serve the sake. So if you have a favorite cup or a favorite glass at home, you should try drinking your sake from that. And then if you try to change the temperature of it, you might move from glass to 10. You might go from 10 to some pottery. All of them are going to have some different impression. This is for a sommelier, what we call a kiki sake shi. This is a wheel of flavor and aroma that's been developed by a scientist whose name I can't remember, I apologize. But you can see so many different things involving taste and odor that are on here. I like to mention this because the professional tasters, the people who evaluate sake professionally, they're working with this flavor and aroma wheel to help prompt what their mind might be finding. Um, a few years ago, um, in my hometown of Portland, Oregon, I found some very accomplished chefs who didn't know so much about sake. And I found a favorite bottle. It was actually Akishika Jumai Kinjo. <laughs> Moroccan Amaginshu. And I'd been loving this sake, and I chose it because at the time of the 2,000 sakes going to the United States, it could be said, this is the driest. And I served my chef friends, and they loved it. I got them to write essays about the sake. None of these four professional chefs identified it as being dry. So here these people are with their trained palates who love the sake, but they can't identify it that it's really a dry sake because they don't have any previous experience to it. So they know that it's delicious. But in the beginning, it may be difficult for you to find, is this sweet, is this dry, is this fruity, is this earthy? You can use a wheel like this to stimulate your imagination. You're not doing it wrong if you don't find these things. But it's interesting to think that we can train our palate to do so. This is another representation. This image comes from the National Research Institute of Brewing. So the government, specifically the tax department, they're heavily invested on improving the quality of sake because we get tax dollars, the government gets tax dollars from sake. Because it's the national beverage of Japan, so much money is spent in research and development. So these are just some of the aroma profiles that can be found in sake. Many people don't know that sake pairs well with food. Um, I mentioned 20 versus 14. Amino acids are so important to flavor, and sake has all 20 of the essential amino acids. Wine only has 14. Of these amino acids, the most important for our health and for umami is glutamic acid, or glutamate. Um, this amino acid was first identified by a professor who was actually born in Kyoto. His name is Ikeda Sensei. 
He's the person who first discovered what we know as umami today. Sake can have more umami because of the presence of glutamic acid, of which it's three to five times more than any beer or wine that is made in the world. That's just your average sake. Tart components. Wine has interesting organic acids, succinic acid, tartaric acid, um, acetic acid, uh, citric acid, malic acid. All of these give wine its sharpness, and people love wine for that. But I think wine, because of these sharp acids, it doesn't always pair well with food because the wine is stronger than the food. Sake wants to be friends with the food, and it can do so because all of these organic acids, they're much lower in sake than they are in wine. And at the bottom of the page, I mentioned <coughs> Applebee's versus French Laundry. Applebee's is kind of a run-of-the-mill restaurant chain in the United States. They have a bar. And in their bar, they have rum from Puerto Rico, vodka from Russia, tequila from Mexico. They have the national spirits of all of these places around the world, but none of them carry sake. So I had a conversation with someone in leadership at Applebee's. And I said, excuse me, I, I just happened to notice you don't carry any sake. He said, oh, well, we're not a sushi restaurant. We don't serve <laughs> Japanese food. I said, I see your point, yet you have um, Russian vodka, yet I see no Russian food on your menu. You have uh, rum from <laughs> uh, Jamaica, but there's no Jamaican food on your menu. So it's a shame that the rest of the world hasn't quite embraced sake. Since it's the national beverage on Japan, I think it can be on any menu, any menu that serves beer or wine. French Laundry has been considered the United States finest restaurant. It's in the heart of Napa Valley, California wine country. It's a three Michelin star restaurant and I think it has been for over a decade. And it's a French restaurant. They're presenting French cuisine. So I also told the Applebee's manager that isn't it interesting that America's most awarded restaurant carries four sakes on their list. They're pairing it with French food. Don't you think your sake, don't you think your menu could benefit from having sake on it as well? I mentioned different temperatures. You know, we can do this at home. I hope you don't do it in a microwave. <laughs> but the way you can warm sake at home is to buy a tokuri, which is a clay pot, if you will, ceramic or clay. And you put the tokuri in a pan of water. You put the sake in the tokuri. And as the pan of water is heated, we know that it might be ready for finish, when it might be ready for service. If I can grab the top of it, and my fingers are almost, it's almost too hot, then I can lift the tokuri, the carafe, if you will. I lift it out of the water and I can serve it. Depending on the imagination of the toji, the master brewer, um, depending on what their inspiration is, they are going to recommend different temperatures to serve the sake. So I've had sake at room temperature and I thought, well, this is nothing so special. And then I tried heating it up and it became quite delicious. So don't give up on the sake. You might be drinking it at the wrong temperature. The real appeal of sake is that it's the very heart of Japan. Um, sake came to Japan about in the year 300 BC, it's speculated. And um, it's been an important part of Shinto ceremonies. There is no Shinto ceremony that does not feature sake. It's also an important part of the taste of Japan, the flavors that we enjoy in our food. And I think it's a healthy alternative to beer and wine. I drank a lot of beer and wine as a young man and almost every time I woke up with a terrific headache or a stomach ache. And what I love telling people about why I started to fall in love with sake is that I could drink it and wake up great the next day there's virtually no hangover. So if you're having problems with a hangover, sake may be beneficial for you as well. So Kyoto has a very interesting history with sake. Um, when you visit Kinkakuji, uh, you can visit and buy a bottle from a Matsui Shuzo near Daimachi Inagi Station. 
the city of Kyoto, not Fushimi, but just the city, they have two Sakagura right now. But at one point, I think Kyoto had 324. And so um, it's important to keep this cultural history alive. Um, at the turn of the 20th century, there was 10,000 sake breweries in Japan. Now there's just over 1,000. So sake breweries have gone by the wayside too as people try other things like chuhai or whiskey or champagne, whatever they're drinking. Um, it's fateful that I'm talking to you tonight because an important archaeological discovery was announced today in the newspapers. And I thought this was quite shocking because I was prepared to talk about the important history that Kyoto has for sake. And uh, at property owned by Tenryuji Ten Ten Temple in Arashiyama, today it was announced that as they were excavating the land to build an apartment building, yeah. they found the remains of what is believed to be the oldest sake brewery discovered in Japan, something that would have been around a thousand years ago, something that was perished during the Oni War. So sake has a really important part of Japanese history. In Arashiyama, very nearby, there's two Shinto shrines that are very important for the people who worship and one shrine is called Metsuo Taisha. And it is said the Kami, the god of sake, resides here. And it's curious, there's different stories about how this was made, the tutelary shrine of Japan. But the shrine was set up by people from China or Korea. It's the Hata clan. And it is said that they brought the technology of koji making to Japan. And it was in the 700s that Japan, Japanese sake got the strong interest of the emperor, and that's when brewing technology really took off. So even though sake goes back to 300 BC, it was in the year 789 that the sake that we're drinking tonight was first really brought into the world. But at that time, it was really for the emperor, and it was for religious ceremonies, and it was that way for another 900 years. In the 1600s, sake was always made for the gods and for the emperor, but it also started to be made for the common man, and it became a common man's drink. Um, I love namazake, that's what my t-shirt says. And part of why I have this on here is that um, I just had a dream. I loved sake in America, and I put myself out there. And I've been making sake off and on now for five years at three breweries. And I want people who have some passion in their life to do their best. It doesn't have to be a money-making activity. I've not made a lot of money from this. But because I followed what I call my passion, what the Japanese people call ikigai, it's really served me well. Nowadays, I'm an English teacher, but I'm in a conversation with the head winemaker at Dom Perignon, the champagne company. Would you believe that the head winemaker at the most popular wine company in the world also loves Japanese sake? <laughs> He's leaving his job this year. He's coming to Japan to make Japanese sake. <laughs> <laughs> He's building a new sakagura in Toyama. And the very important architect, uh, Kengo Kuma, is designing the building. So it'll be available for production in December. And then next year, they'll start exporting their sake around the world. So if people like Dom Perignon, the oldest champagne maker in the world, if these people take an interest in our culture, don't you think we should too? We should take advantage of the fact that we live in such a great country with such a strong brewing tradition. So I think that concludes my thoughts. Do you have any questions for me? <laughs> I'd like to take a couple of questions. You were doing your tasting and you were demonstrating the way to you know, take how the aroma can you, you, you take air in through your nose where you're drinking it or, or, or take a little slurp of air. Is there any value to decanting? Uh, the way you would decant certain bottles of wine in order to introduce air like before tasting? Some have told me this, but 
most of the people I've talked to have suggested that it does no value to it. Um, when we open up a bottle of wine, the oxygen gets in the wine, and it is said that within maybe three days, the wine has been changed dramatically. And in a fine restaurant, if they can't serve the wine, they might dump it out, they might use it in cooking. What I like to mention about sake is that the top of the bottle can be taken off, and two weeks later, the sake is still interesting to drink. Of course, oxidation occurs, but it doesn't have to be consumed so quickly. Um, there's a sake bar in Kyoto called Nihonshu Bar Yoramu, and Yoram is an Israeli guy, and he has many bottles of sake where he says, oh, I first opened this bottle 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Won't you try it? And I tried it, and it was amazing. I don't understand why, but maybe because there's a kami, a god, inside of the bottle, <laughs> maybe that has something to do with its preservation. <laughs> One more question. Uh, yeah. My favorite sake is my sake. <laughs> no, so, um, I love so many sakes, it's so difficult. I, I especially love Moroccan Nama Genshu. I love Yamaha. The is like, what do you eat with like? Oh, what do I eat with? Oh, I'm sorry. Cheese. Oh, what kind of cheese? Uh, any kind of cheese, but I love Gouda. Um, I was hired by the Dutch government to make a sake list pairing Gouda cheese from the Netherlands. <laughs> but I usually drink it alone the first time, and then I'll drink it with anything. But the cheese has been my favorite. It's difficult. <laughs> All right, last question. Ah, uh, so I was curious. You did mention that when the rice is very, very finely ground down, yeah. you said you recommend that that is always drinking or drank chilled. Yes. Is there a scientific reason for that, or is that a personal preference? Oh, that's such a great question. <laughs> um, the scientific reason is that um, the sake is so delicate because there's just starch that's being used. There's no longer fats and, and lipids. And there's aroma at work. And most connoisseurs would say, that's how you should drink it. But with sake, there's not these hard and fast rules all the time. So I've had people say, oh, try this super premium sake. I've heated it up to 40 degrees. It's better that way. So I think the takeaway here is to experiment with it. Yeah. It's such a good question. I'll have to think about that harder. <laughs> but your your takeaway is that there's not a it is not some objectively correct way to drink it. It's the preferred, is, yes. Okay. Yeah, it's a preference. It's customer preference or consumer preference. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, Gordon will be here the rest of the day. So, if you have any more lingering questions, uh, he's going to be here. You're going to be here, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And try, please try his sake. Uh, you know that's that's available here. Uh, let's give another round of applause to Gordon.